This was the longest week of my life. The world is weird. It makes me not the least I get to talk about it. With Jose. Tim Pool is a person with a YouTube channel. Two channels, actually. He produces about six videos daily where he comments on the news of the day. He is not a popular guy on the left. To hear him tell it, it's because the left has lost its mind. While I've watched a few of his videos in the past and even made a response to one of them, I wanted to see what a week-long trek through the world of his content would produce. This video covers all the video content created by Tim Pool from December 15th to December 21st in 2019. Let's dive right in. By far, the biggest story of that week in the U.S. political world was the vote in Congress to impeach President Donald Trump. Of the 42 videos Tim produced, 11 were about impeachment in one way or another. They had titles such as, Democrats slammed by protests as impeachment support collapses, majority now oppose impeachment. Impeachment backfire gets worse as Trump now defeats every 2020 Democrat in major polling. Democrats have not impeached Trump. Democrats' own witness undermines Pelosi's strategy. Gee, I wonder why people would think this guy is right-wing. These obviously clickbait titles are how Tim advertises his political videos. The Democrats are consistently on the verge of collapse, and the Republicans are on an endless winning streak. But to hear Tim tell it, he's actually trying to help the Democrats by offering honest criticism. The only problem is he has no idea what he's talking about. Tim has an interesting take on the Trump impeachment proceedings. He believes it's a top-to-bottom farce. To Tim, Trump not only has done nothing wrong, but the Democrats have been lawless in pursuing him, and the subject of the investigation should be Joe Biden. One of the annoying things about watching his videos is how rarely he explains why he believes the things he believes. Of the 11 impeachment videos, only two really outline his case. I suppose he went into detail in previous videos, which would be fine if he told his viewers where they could get more information, like say a link to relevant videos. Instead, his channel is set up so that you have to have some knowledge of right-wing narratives to believe anything that he's saying, or even to really follow it. Not that it would help, because he's very wrong on impeachment. To be fair, Tim doesn't want us to take his legal expertise on the matter, though. Here's an example of Tim trying to use an expert to cite the claim that impeachment is baseless. Congress is claiming Trump obstructed Congress by rejecting these subpoenas. Trump's argument is that he has uh, executive privilege, this information, and he's under no obligation to turn it over without judicial review. And I sounds right. It sounds like he's right. Why does Alan Dershowitz have authority on this? Famous Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden supporter Alan Dershowitz says. So Tim's position relies not on the merit of the argument, but on his status as a Clinton and Biden supporter, he's using Dershowitz's identity to support his claim, ignoring the many people who disagree with him. For example, one of Dershowitz's own students. Abuse of power was rejected, and terms like that mm -hmm. as explicit grounds no, for that, no, that, that's impeachment. Not true, Alan. Look, these th 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 that's not abuse of power was not yes, rejected. Yes, they were. There was and and and, well, and the Alan, word maladministration. That's, that's that's maladministration is a totally different yeah. thing. It's also worth noting that Dershowitz is currently advising the Trump administration on impeachment proceedings, but that's only looking at the second article of impeachment, obstruction of Congress during the impeachment process. Tim's dismissal of the first article is even more laughable. For those unfamiliar, the short version of the obstruction of power claim is that President Trump withheld aid to Ukraine that had been appropriated by Congress to pressure the president of Ukraine to either investigate or announce an investigation into Joe Biden and his son Hunter, and also to investigate Ukraine's supposed influence on the 2016 election. Tim finds these allegations absurd. One of the claims he seriously makes is that in no way was Donald Trump worried about Joe Biden. Why would Trump be scared of Biden, of all people? And Biden even won the nomination yet. It's a lie. Articles published as far back in March of this year, a few months before Trump's conversation with the president of Ukraine, suggest that Trump was definitely worried about Biden. While Biden certainly isn't my favorite Democrat in the field, he's undeniably the frontrunner, and has been for as long as he's been in the Democratic primary. To say Trump is not concerned about Biden, or that he doesn't consider him a political rival, is to be willfully ignorant. Tim then tries to describe Trump's state of mind on why he withheld the money. 
I think for one, Trump doesn't want to give U.S. money to foreign countries. I think that's a fact. He's withholding aid from like Lebanon or uh, and other countries. I don't think Ukraine is special. So this is something Trump does all the time, but Democrats are arbitrarily choosing this case, even though this is a specific type of military aid that Congress voted on giving to Ukraine. But even that isn't the real reason Trump is doing this. Let's listen to Tim tell us the real reason Trump is doing this. I think he is, he is angry that they tried to smear him for three years with what we are now, look, and I, 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 can, I can empathize, man, with the, with the IG report, with them showing all the FISA abuse and the lie after lie after lie from the media about what was really going on, I can't say I blame Trump because he's upset about this. Tim believes Trump triggered the investigation as a form of retribution for all the lies the media and the Democrats have supposedly been throwing at him. And Tim doesn't think that using the office of the president and U.S. foreign policy to go after your political rivals is an abuse of power. Of course, that's also not the real reason. Let's hear Tim give us the real reason once again. And this time it's Trump isn't doing it out of anger, but it's because he really cares about America. Trump said, do us a favor, though, because our country has been through a lot. He was clearly talking about us as America. And if you, 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 you want to argue, you got to argue from the facts. But they don't do that. They say, Trump demanded a favor. Trump said, I want a favor. He never said that. So they keep going up. They say it's not disputed, but they've never presented any evidence that Trump's frame of mind in that conversation had anything to do with Biden. As a quick aside, Biden was mentioned specifically in the conversation, which I believe proves Trump was thinking about him to some degree. But the important point is none of what Tim is saying holds together. Trump didn't care about Biden during this conversation, but he did mention him by name as a person to be investigated. Trump withheld the money as part of standard policy, but Tim also acknowledges it was a partisan attack on political rivals. But also, it wasn't about that, it was about his love of country. Perhaps there's some nuance here I'm missing, but after watching these videos, I'm not sure Tim knows what he thinks about this. The only constant in all of these videos is the narrative that Trump needs to be considered innocent, regardless of the justifications. This is how narrative is used to reshape the facts. You can talk about what's happening in the news, but the facts are being distorted to reinforce the narrative that Trump did nothing wrong. Contradictions don't matter, and neither do objective facts, just the narrative. Here's another example of how Tim misrepresents reality to push a Trump innocence narrative. Tim really wants to hammer home the idea that Trump hasn't committed any statutory crimes, so this whole impeachment process doesn't meet the standards of high crimes and misdemeanors. All of the other presidents who actually faced impeachment were being charged with statutory crimes. Trump is the first president to face, to face no statutory crime. And about 40 seconds before that, he asserts something I want us to remember. He would rightly defer to the expert opinion of an academic on the Constitution over a journalist. If you're an academic and you're an expert on the Constitution and you say Trump was not impeached, I defer to you over the journalist. If you think Trump should be impeached on these issues, I will still defer to you over the journalists. He's completely right when he says this, but he's also completely wrong when he says the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors means that statutory crimes must be a part of the impeachment process. In an article for The Atlantic, Frank O. Bowman III, a professor at the University of Missouri School of Law, who literally wrote a book on the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors, goes into detail about the origin of the phrase and how it most certainly applies to abuse of power and doesn't require any statutory crimes to have been committed. Here are a few excerpts from that article that provide historical context. In the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton made the larger point that impeachment is directed at political offenses that proceed from the abuse or violation of some public trust. He provides a number of examples of people being impeached without having committed a crime, and he offers a famous hypothetical and one of his own to illustrate the subject even further. Suppose, he imagined, that in 1861, when secession fever broke out, the president had not been Abraham Lincoln, but a man who, whether moved by fear or an honest but perverted political theory, refused to mobilize the Union against the rebellion. Would we say that the only remedy in such a case was to allow dissolution of the country because the president's inaction was no crime? Or suppose, to bring the case still closer to home, a president were to subordinate himself and the interests of his own country to a foreign power because he or his family could make money by doing so, or because the foreign country agreed to help him secure re-election. Does anyone seriously suggest that the question of whether such behavior is impeachable turns on the niceties of ethics rules or campaign finance laws? So why does Tim continue on with this obviously wrong narrative of impeachment having no merit because no statutory crimes have been leveled against President Trump? 
It's because it supports the narrative he loves so dearly, and that's that the Democrats are not only insane, but their supporters are complete fools. Tim, apparently, can't understand why the Democrats are impeaching Trump. Maybe they're sitting there being like, Trump, ne if Trump's going to get reelected, he needs a good villain, so they're all going to pretend to be it. Obviously, I'm joking, but I can't imagine why else they would be doing this. But then he figures out the Democrats are actually on a suicide mission. Rock in a hard place? Whatever. Impeachment. This is the Democrats' final salvo. It's their kamikaze. They've lost, they know it, and it's all they have left. And then he finally lands on what is quite possibly the most ridiculous explanation as to why Democrats are impeaching Trump. I think the reality is the Democrats know their constituents, these, these resistance types, are not very smart or are lacking information. They're ignorant. I'm not trying to be mean, but it's true. Tim Pool thinks that the Democrats are trying to fool their base into thinking Trump has been removed from office. In what world does this make any sense? Does he think the Democratic voters are so stupid that they won't notice Trump is still in office between now and the election? Tim's evidence for this outrageous claim is provided in a different video because he's very bad at what he does and doesn't evidence claims when he first makes them. Liberals on Twitter think impeachment means Trump is getting kicked out of office. His evidence is random people on Twitter. I don't think that really meets the standard of a scientific poll, and it's not really a demonstration that this is a widespread problem, but it does meet Tim's standard of cherry-picking facts to buttress a narrative of the left being made up of people detached from reality. He also has another theory on why Democrats are being so supposedly self-destructive. Should I believe that she thinks she's actually doing something here? Because we all know Trump isn't going to be removed from office. So why laugh and smile as you go to impeach him? Because it feels good? Or is it because you want to watch the world burn? Rashida Tlaib just wants to see the world burn. She is, in fact, the Joker. But Tim, in an effort to speak to his fellow liberals, does occasionally offer political advice, and wow, this may be the worst of his commentary. For instance, here's a slogan he recommended to Democrats. If the Democrats' whole campaign was, Trump's not that bad, we'll be a little bit better, they would be much, much better off than, they are, than where they are today with protests erupting at their town hall meetings. Democrats should run on a vaguely pro-Trump sentiment that they're only going to do a little bit better? Does he not understand that Donald Trump has never been a popular president? And how does this appeal to Democratic voters who, generally speaking, don't like Trump? But that's not the end of his awful advice. Tim repeatedly mentions Democrats have nothing to offer and need new ideas to sway the public. I think the only conclusion we have is that the Democrats are campaigning on things no one cares about. They're saying nothing. No one cares what they have to say. Interesting point, and totally true, if you ignore the Democratic primary, which had been going on this whole week. You know, the primary where they're discussing various ideas on healthcare, college tuition plans, climate change strategies, campaign finance laws, financial regulations, income inequality strategies, and plenty of other ideas. I'm not sure how someone could think that the Democrats aren't trying to offer anything new or different, but I know why Tim hasn't heard of any of this stuff. Only seven candidates took the stage last night, and they go on and name it. I don't care. I didn't watch the debate. Speaking specifically to Bernie, though, Tim thinks it would have been a solid strategy to have supported Trump's investigation into Biden. Look, if you're going to ask me, I think Bernie should be, should be behind Trump on this one. Think about it. For one, politically, it gets Biden out of the way. I don't think that's the right reason to do it. That's, you know political nonsense. Wow, there are so many reasons not to do this, such as it's wrong on the facts, it harms your standing within the Democratic Party, and it gives ammo to Bernie's opposition in the election, which would be pretty accurate when he's teaming up with Republicans to target Democrats. Tim is also quick to support Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard's vote of present, not siding for or against impeachment. But you may have noticed that Tulsi Gabbard voted present. And man, I was on the airplane, but I wanted to give a standing ovation to this. This is the best vote of anybody. Tulsi Gabbard's not running for re-election. She's running for president. She has to be there for most Americans. This was a move that annoyed both the left and the right, but he sees it as the right move to make. His undying support of Gabbard, often complimenting her political skills, is betrayed by the fact that she polls at under 2% in the Democratic primary. I'm sure Tim would blame the DNC or the media, but Bernie Sanders faces similar challenges, and he's managed to be one of the frontrunners. That's because people actually like him and his policies, and based on a recent poll, not many 
many people like Tulsi. But hey, this deeply unpopular Democrat is an example of someone doing it right in Tim's eyes. So that's the sort of support one would get for following Tim's strategies on how to run a successful campaign. I believe all these suggestions from Tim Pool reveal two things. The first is that Tim is genuine. This could be portrayed as him providing his bona fides to his right-wing audience as being ostensibly someone on the left, but the reactions and comments tend to be disinterested on how to repair the left and more interested in destroying it. I think he genuinely believes that these suggestions will right the Democratic Party and let it have a brighter future in American politics. The second thing these suggestions reveal is that Tim Pool is completely clueless when it comes to politics. His ideas betray an appalling ignorance on political maneuvering and public sentiment. It pretends the Democratic base is non-existent or not worth considering, and it praises strategies that have been proven to fail. Tim just doesn't know what he's talking about here. Before leaving his impeachment discussion, I'll highlight one more clip. Here's Tim talking about Donald Trump's political leanings. Donald Trump, in all re in reality, right, for those that are actually tracking politics, is a moderate. He really is. You know, they want to claim he's far right. No, Trump's, Trump's a New York Democrat. I think the only reason he ran as a Republican is because Democrats would never elect a billionaire. I don't know how someone could possibly believe this. The man who spent his administration by trying to undo everything done by President Obama, from the Iran deal to the Paris Climate Accord to the Affordable Care Act, the man who pushed tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans, and the man who is appointing conservative judges across the country, is a New York Democrat? And that's a narrative that, if you can convince someone of, you can convince them of anything. Donald Trump is supposedly a moderate. So what in Tim's mind would a real conservative look like? Recently, Cenk Uygur of the Young Turks announced a run for Congress in California. Although well known for being on the left, a number of spurious articles attacking him appeared in the supposedly left-wing mainstream media. Tim commented on this in his video titled, the Young Turk's Cenk Uyghur is getting destroyed by establishment over his animal love endorsement. Now I really want to stress the title here. Tim gets very angry about misleading headlines, but what does this one suggest? The media is attacking Cenk, yes, but it's only vaguely hinted at being based on falsehood by the quotation marks around animal love. And the quotation marks are there because Tim is just afraid YouTube will censor him if he uses a forbidden word. This is because YouTube will, will shut down videos, they'll demonetize videos, and I can not use certain words to explain certain ideas. I'm sure Tim would say, well, if someone clicked the video, they'd get the full story, and then they would walk away realizing that He's not saying it's true. He's actually saying the opposite. First of all, the viral clip is out of context. I refuse. I don't care if it's, if it's Cenk Uger. I don't care if it's Nick Fuentes. You take an out of context clip and I can't tell what it is. I'm going to tell you to GTFO, period. Pretty straightforward. Tim clears things up. Anyone who'd watch his video would understand that this was about defending Cenk about the claim, not advancing it. But if we look under the comments of this video, we'll see that his clarifications haven't really affected a large number of viewers. Comment after comment about Jank wanting to have sex with animals. I'd be a little worried if I made a video, supposedly, to defend someone, only to find everyone repeating the exact charge that I was trying to debunk. People don't really watch Tim's videos for his analysis, but to have their narratives be confirmed, and in this case, it's a narrative about someone on the left being some sort of weird deviant. It also might not have helped things if Tim had not spent so much time complaining that Jenk yelled at him one time and that Tim doesn't like that he's running for office. That's what most of the video is actually about. And in the video titled, Conservative Memes Are Being Censored Because Fact Checkers Think Leftist Media Is The Default, we get more on Tim's feelings about the left-wing hypocrisy in the media. NewsGuard, which is apparently left-wing, had the gall to criticize The Daily Wire, which is a news outlet run by everyone's favorite, Ben Shapiro. They say that right here, does not repeatedly publish false content. Thumbs up. It's got a green check mark. Okay. Thank you, that, thank you, thank, thank you NewsGuard, for letting me know that there are severe issues with, with Daily Wire, but at least they're not publishing false content, right? Actually, they say this, uh, credibility. However, the Daily Wire frequently publishes false and misleading information. Okay, hold on. You told me they don't do that. And then in your own content about it, you say they do do that. I got a contradiction here. NewsGuard has made a factual error. I'm sorry. Got him. 
Now, a clever person here might go on to read the very lengthy 31 paragraphs detailing all the times the Daily Wire misrepresented a story, but no, that's not what Tim is here to do. He's here to talk about the little summary graphic at the top not matching the more detailed breakdown at the bottom. Well, specifically this sentence here. Tim calls this inconsistency a factual error, but the error here appears to be that NewsGuard isn't being hard enough on the Daily Wire in its summary graphic. And you know, I think we have to give it to Tim this time. NewsGuard is just too soft on right-wing news websites. I'm not sure how being too soft on a right-wing news outlet proves that the fact-checkers have a left-wing bias, though. Kind of the opposite, actually. Better luck next time, Tim. But my favorite part of this video is when Tim starts going off on BuzzFeed News. Let's see how angry he gets. Fake news we've ever seen, but it also combines the left's penchant for taking race, for, for pretending not to be racist, but pushing the most racist concepts you can ever imagine. BuzzFeed literally wrote a story that is fake, arguing that two black men fought to the death over fried chicken. That is fake news. It is fake as it comes, and it is racist, and I am disgusted by it. Tim, though, thinks BuzzFeed News was running this story as something to laugh at, and that they're all secretly racist. Because apparently BuzzFeed thinks it's funny or some, or interesting, or clickbaity, to make a story about two black guys fighting, over, fighting to the death over fried chicken. You know what's interesting though? The BuzzFeed News article actually never mentions the race of either of the two men, and it doesn't publish pictures of them either, so how does Tim know they're black? I didn't just want to accuse Tim of making a racist assumption here, so I took the extra step of digging up the original video on this story from November 6, 2019, titled, BuzzFeed wrote a fake headline about two black men fighting to death over chicken. So BuzzFeed News didn't mention race at all, but Tim puts it right in the headline. That's an interesting choice. Tim's problem with this chicken sandwich story is that there was no literal chicken sandwich in anyone's hands, but rather, people were in line to buy said sandwich. For context, this sandwich was making a much-awaited return, and BuzzFeed News based its headline on a statement from the police. Oh, as Tim argues, Nowhere did they say they were fighting over a sandwich. What the police said was that it was preliminarily, pre they, they, they said it's preliminary, but this was related to the release of a sandwich. Could it be that, I don't know, because of the release of the sandwich, a guy was going to meet up with another guy at the location and they weren't going to get the sandwich? The sandwich has nothing to do with it. It seems Tim got more information about this news story from an article in the Daily Mail, which posted lots of pictures. There's a comment from the cousin of the stabbed man clearly upset that his cousin's death is being used to market a chicken sandwich. Tim seems to think this proves his point that the murder had nothing to do with the sandwich, though. Then Tim starts to get really worked up. This is when they cover the violence. This is the, when they cover the violence that, that, that when I was growing up in Chicago, this is the kind of stuff we deal with. And now you've got this dude's, this family saying they weren't fighting over a chicken sandwich, man, but that's the funny story that BuzzFeed gets to report, isn't it? These people are hypocrites and they're disgusting. You know, I never really claimed to be a media expert, at least not the way Tim does. I'm just curious, does BuzzFeed News ever dare to talk about the violence in Chicago? These articles are all from 2019, and they seem to suggest that, yes, in fact, they do. Lots of important stories are there. If Tim thinks this isn't enough, then I have some great news for him. He has a platform where he can cover all of these stories and more, and can really put a spotlight on the violence problem in Chicago he apparently cares about a lot. For some reason, he chooses not to. In the interest of fairness, Tim's two primary channels actually did cover a very specific crime in Chicago quite extensively in 2019. One that did also involve issues of race, and it so inspired Tim that he made 12 videos alone on the subject, and that's the Jussie Smollett staged hate crime. So when Tim points his finger at BuzzFeed News for being racist and ignoring violence in Chicago, when Tim's recent work in said field is to obsessively discuss a staged hate crime, he can spare me the indignation. Maybe you should take a look at the sort of stories he propagates, instead of lying about the people who are doing the very thing he accuses them of not doing. Oh, and going back briefly to the Popeye story, Tim wanted to give credit to the Daily Mail for doing a better job covering the story. Funny how Tim doesn't get upset about the Daily Mail saying it was over a chicken sandwich, huh? Now let's talk about how much Tim cares about the media. In the artfully titled video, California has nuked leftist media from orbit, hundreds of writers are being fired under new law. Tim describes how a new law was passed in California that puts a limit on how much work employers can purchase from freelancers without making them full-time employees. Tim sums up the problem for us like this. 
are these leftists saying, hey, companies aren't paying their employees enough and they keep hiring freelancers. (laughs) Got an idea. Let's make it so they can't hire freelancers more than 35 times per year. That way they'll be forced to hire the freelancers, right? It all makes sense. This is a progressive victory, they say. In reality, it's very different. In reality, they say, well, we can't hire all these people. Just fire all these people. We'll save money and we'll figure it out somewhere else. Or better yet, they're going to hire freelancers in different states. You know what's going to happen to these people who don't have work anymore? They're not going to be able to pay their rent. Then they're going to end up in a homeless camp, and it's going to be your fault. This video is in the context of talking about a news story where Fox eliminated 200 jobs right before the holiday season, no less. Many of these cuts are coming from SB Nation, a blogging network owned by Vox. Tim even reads a small excerpt in an official statement from SB Nation. This is a bittersweet note of thanks to our California independent contractors. John Ness, executive director of SB Nation, wrote in a post on Monday. In 2020, we will move California's team blo- California's team blogs from our established system with hundreds of contractors to a new one run by a team of new SB Nation employees. You know what they literally said? We need these jobs filled. If you're in California, you're fired. We're going to rehire because the jobs aren't going anywhere. Other people. Think about that for a second. This is not a case of being told your company can't support you. I'm sorry, we have to let you go. It's not a case of Vox going out of business. It's literally Vox saying, you guys passed the law. I got to fire you, but this dude over here in Arizona, he's all good. He's hired. He gets your job now. What would happen if we clicked on that link and read the full statement? We'd find this telling paragraph. To comply with this new law, we will not be replacing California contractors with contractors from other states. Rather, we're encouraging any contractors interested in one of our newly created full-time or part-time employee positions to apply. We know many of our California contractors already have other full-time jobs and may not have the bandwidth to apply, but we hope to see many of them join us as employees. So SB Nation is getting rid of its freelance positions and replacing them with full-time and part-time jobs. Although I do feel for the freelancers who have full-time jobs and we're just doing this freelancing to make a little extra income. If there are examples of people being unfairly hurt by this law, this story isn't it. Tim tries to portray it as people being cast out in the streets with no source of income and now they're going to be struggling living in homeless camps because they can't pay their bills, saying that all these jobs are going out of state when, in fact, they aren't. They're being replaced by full-time positions, which is sort of how the law is supposed to work, because full-time positions are better than freelance ones. And this is Tim all over. He finds these stories that he thinks reinforce his narratives, in this case, the leftist media championing socialist policies that destroy jobs, but he doesn't check the facts well enough to make sure they don't say the exact opposite. He finds enough information to confirm his narrative of leftist media pushing a destructive agenda, and then he moves on confident that his audience won't do the basics to fact check him. There's one criticism I know I'm going to get, so I want to address it right here. I've seen him use this defense on Twitter before saying, watch all my videos before you criticize me, which is frankly preposterous. When there are hundreds of hours, no one can possibly do this. The point of this response is to show you all what it's like to watch a single week of his content. If I was a person unfamiliar with Tim Pool and decided to give his content a try for a week, what would I find? What would I see? These are the results of that. I have to stop here. This video is actually supposed to be much, much longer, but I I think people can only stomach so much Tim Pool at a time, so I'm gonna have to break this up into two parts. I hope you all will tune in in the future. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks to my patrons. Follow me on Twitter. Um, curious qu- cat questions, sure. Want to hit my next patron goal? I'll be releasing a bonus video and I might do a Q&A. I'll have a community post asking for more questions in the future. So if you've got any questions for me, hold on to them and we'll do a big QA video. That'll be fun. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell.